This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. You are watching or listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. I'm Steve. That's Doug. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Stephen. Good to see you, buddy. Okay, good to see you. So I know this week you wanted to talk about uh, kitchens. A lot of people want to talk about kitchens. I'm not sure how much I have to offer about kitchens, but actually, as I thought about it, current project, um, maybe things have changed um, since uh, even in a couple of years. Um, so uh, maybe there's more to talk about than, than I thought. I hope so, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I spent so much time cooking and are you the cook at home? No, I'm not. I clean oh, the dishes. However, that's I, one of my I'm tips, the, so that's why I have this tip. Yeah, yeah. I get it now. I'm the cook. Oh. Actually, if you and I were together, it would work perfectly, perfectly, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. All right, Doug, uh, why don't you start three tips on, uh, on kitchens. I've got three tips, and we do have a viewer question this week, so uh, why don't you kick it off? All right, man. So uh, I'm talking dimensions today because this seems to be a mystery uh, to many people that I speak to when we get rolling on kitchen. So tip number one, know your typical kitchen cabinet size. So many people don't know this, but a kitchen countertop is 36 inches off a of finished floor. Now, when you walk through the house, you go to other countertops like powder rooms or bathrooms. Th those are different. Um, they're working their way to 36 inches in height, but that is a very good uh, work height surface. So if you've got 36 inches in height, many or most times we see a 24 inch deep lower cabinet depth. The reason for that is we put pots and pans in there, silverware, and I like to see rollout drawers, which are really helpful. We see that more and more in contemporary uh, uh, kitchen cabinets uh, today. The other reason we do 24 inches in depth is because you can stand at a kitchen counter and you can bend over that countertop and you can still get to the back. So 24 inches works very, very nicely. Now, what about uppers? So an upper cabinet, a typical depth is going to be almost exactly half that. You're going to see 12 inches in depth. Well, why is that? It's so you're really not banging your head on it, right? When you're bending over the, the kitchen counter, you don't want to hit your head. Now, in higher end kitchens, we like to make the uppers 14 inches in depth because many times we'll see larger dishes and platters uh, that they're storing in those uh, just because they've got larger sets. But 12 inches will almost always accommodate even a large dish, which we'll see at about 11, 11 and a half inches. So 12 inches for uppers. Another question I get quite frequently is how much space do I leave between the countertop and the uppers? I like to see 18 inches there. That's an industry standard and you can slide a coffee maker in there, a Cuisinart, a toaster. Uh, 18 inches is the right dimension. We'll talk about other dimensions when we talk about other functional uses for cabinets uh, in my next tip. Lastly, a ceiling height in most of our homes are eight feet. If you live in an older home, you might see a lower ceiling height, but eight feet is pretty typical. If we've got a 36 inch countertop and 18 inches to the uppers, then what we're gonna see is 30 inches, 36 or 42 inches for those upper dimensions. Sometimes we see uh, a contractor will leave space above the uppers. That's not nearly uh, as uh, pretty as taking those uppers all the way to the top and doing some sort of crown up there. In that case, you'll probably have a 30 or a 36 inch upper, and then you'll put a nice crown uh, to finish off uh, dimensionally um, the cabinet. So anyway, uh, know your typical kitchen cabinet sizes, and that's a pretty broad overview. It's interesting because these dimensions, they roll off your tongue, and I, I have them too, just because we've done so many, you become, you become accustomed to them. And of course, it, it all has to do with, let's say a typical size, I guess, grown up. Um, and, and you think about 30 inches being the height of a, of a table, 36 for a countertop. And, and so there are, there are certain, once you understand those dimensions, then it makes sense, these cabinet dimensions that you're referring to. So hopefully you have a diagram there that will. I uh, do. Illustrate. I've got some images right. that uh, I'll be popping up there as uh, I go through those numbers. So thanks for mentioning that. Absolutely. So once you have these dimensions, sort of know them, then you can really begin to play. I mean, I think once you're aware and we're aware of these of these numbers, then we're able to kind of manipulate um, manipulate uh, 
uh, design, but it's it's not like you're it's a free for all. Like you, when when you're right. starting something like a kitchen, you're like oh my god, it's like, you know how do I start? And in fact, there are a lot of knowns, and then it's yes. really playing within those knowns. Very good point. Okay. That being said, this one was an unknown to me. Uh, it's a new product, and it's kind of neat because I have a client that that mentioned that they saw something called the galley. It is a sink system, a kitchen sink system. It's like a trough. It's it can be big, but let's imagine it's six feet long by almost two feet wide. It is a trough, right? So call it a big trough sink. And I say, well, what's so special about that? It's actually a system in the sense that now you buy inserts. So the trough has like a little edge, a little lip on the sides, and you can begin to drop in different cutting boards, colanders, strainers, uh, dish racks, on and on and on. But these are all different like systems. So you buy the systems that you think you need. So yes, it's expensive. It's a deep sink, typically two, two sort of chef style or kitchen style, uh, I mean, chef style uh, faucets um, that are either side, let's say it's six feet long. And now I can really begin to drop in all of these different elements. So why, why this, uh, this, this, um, this product? I, I think it has to do with the kitchen being really considered a, a kind of entertainment space. Imagine the, the holidays or having people over and wanting to kind of prepare something on this side. Maybe someone's cleaning something on this side, uh, preparing uh, cleaning vegetables, maybe this side that they're um, doing some cutting. And on this side, there's actually presentation. It may be, uh, there's actually a little tray for ingredients, dips, what have you. But really it's it's kind of endless what you can do with it. It's the galley.com. It's not a, it's an endorsement for their product. I'm just uh, using it now for one project, but it's, it's fascinating because uh, of the way that you can use it. You can really can have, let's say, prep cleaning, you know, cutting. Uh, maybe there's meats over here with juices that you want to separate from this side, from fruits and vegetables. Um, maybe there's some dishes which are accumulating. You can put them in this dish rack. So there's really all the different sort of things that you can imagine you'd have in a sink. And then when you're done prepping everything, you put it all under the sink and you can put the sort of flat, nice presentation, uh, sort of countertop almost to make it feel like one integrated uh, Countertop. So now the sink is gone, all the dirty dishes are gone, and now you can sort of have these nice trays with the finished the finished food. So it's a really cool system. I'll have to let you know exactly how that works out because it's in process right now. It's expensive, but I think I think it has a lot of promise. Um, you know, I think a sink often. I think about my sink. I've got a big sink. It's nice to have a big sink, but I can't really use it as anything other than a sink. And when I'm cleaning something, I can't have dirty dishes in there. It just seems sort of limiting. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that someone, I'm sure many people have thought about it, but I'm glad there is a product out there that now has been systematized based on kind of how you want to use something. And uh, I imagine for the well-to-do that has a, have one, a big sink that have big parties that this is a, would be a great product. So the galley, the galley is a new product that uh, I'm looking into and I'll have to report on it after we uh, implement it. Very cool, Stephen. I'm on the site. That is really, it's so like functional and it's pretty and wow, it looks like a really neat product. Super yeah, right. cool, man. Okay. So my second tip, know your typical kitchen seating clearances. So let's start with a chair. Okay. Again, a kind of a mystery to many people. So how high is a chair, the seat off of finished floor? Well, it's one foot, six inches. So a typical seat height is 18 inches. A typical seat width is also 18 inches. I actually mentioned all of these uh, facts. I mentioned on my fact today uh, post in 2016, you can find them on Instagram and the videos on YouTube uh, at how to architect. So uh, the height of a chair is 18, the width of a chair is 18. Now, as people get larger, right, we've got an obesity issue in the country, uh, chairs are getting wider and these um, allowances are getting larger, but seat heights have really not changed even as people have gotten taller, typically 18 inches. Now, if you've got a seat height at 18, what should your countertop be? Well, certainly not 36. It should actually be 30 inches. So if you're gonna put a desk in a kitchen, for example, that countertop is going to bump down from 36 inches down to uh, a height of 30 inches. Now, if you've got a kitchen island, that's something completely different. So we had talked about a kitchen countertop height at 36 inches. Sometimes we see uh, a, where you've got large or tall benches, 42 inches, but I like to keep it at 36. So if we've got a kitchen countertop height of 36 and we're going to have people sitting there, your bench height should actually be six inches higher than 18 or 24 inches. Now, 
in kitchens today, people really like to use those really tall benches that you find at bars. If you're going to use those, then you're probably going to be seeing uh, a countertop height at 42 inches. But at the end of the day, uh, 36 inches for a countertop height and a bench height of 24 inches. Now, uh, how many people can you put at a kitchen island. So, you know, uh, people love to put islands in their kitchen and they want to get as many people seated there as possible. What I like to do is plan for 24 inches for each person. So if we set 24, if you've got a four foot kitchen island, for example, you're going to be able to put two people there, two 24 inch spaces. Again, uh, as people get bigger, what I like to do if our clients are bigger uh, I'd like to plan 27 or even 28 inches per person because it's going to be a lot more comfortable. But a good rule of thumb is your your seat is actually 18 inches in width and the allowance for one human being is 24 inches in width at a kitchen island. You know, it, it's interesting because these dimensions, as you say, have changed and it, it's never more apparent when, you know, as an architect, I used to like to buy, you know, sort of used or older you know, chair by a famous architect, Le Corbusier or Franco Wright or something like that, and yeah. for reproduction even. And then you get this chair and you sit it and you're like, oh my God, it's like <laughs> so small. <laughs> what doesn't even fit in the Le Corbusier chair because it's just so small. I mean, I mean, he was, you know, he was a smaller guy. Franco Wright was very short. Yeah. Um, and it just has to do with, you know, I guess people were smaller at that time and uh, we have to sort of upgrade. Yes. Uh, upgrade the, the dimensions. So I think I've, most of these dimensions have sort of stayed very similar, actually, though, the, the, the things in the kitchen. Um, only ones that I have a client that uh, asked if we could make the countertop at a different height because they're tall. And um, I said, yeah, it's allowed. I mean, it's we're custom designing your house. We can do it. So if they right. wanted it 37 or 37 and a half or something like that. And okay. it's not hard to do. I mean, it's easy to do. So uh, harder for the kids, maybe, but um, for a taller person, no problem. So Right. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Good tip, Doug. My my second tip sounds um, it sounds maybe it sounds over the top, but I've had a lot of requests for it, and now I'm thinking even for myself, I, I think it's a good idea, and it's ha having two dishwashers. Ah. Now, you, you know, you think two dishwashers, oh, it's overkill. Um, a lot of people, I think, design. You know, Thanksgiving is just past. They they just sort of design with Thanksgiving in mind and holidays and entertaining, and the house is full, which happens like for me once a year. They think, oh, I need a big oven because i got to cook a turkey like once a year, or every other year, because if you go to the in-laws or what have you. So I hate when, when, when this happens, when we're sort of designing for the one-off uh, example, the one-off day. But the dishwasher, because I'm the dishwasher, uh, it's an everyday occurrence. Yes. And with a couple of kids, it really is, you know, twice a day kind of uh, happening. And, you know, after dinner, you put all the dishes in there, you wash them. And ideally for me, I would have uh, a dishwasher that's already finished, open it up, and the dishes would right be there. It would be right there. And, and for, for any typical week, you really have a kind of regular rotation of dishes, of, of uh, silverware and, and cups. It's not like I'm using every single thing in the, in the cabinet. I don't even know where all those things go when it's sort of special occasions. But, but I think um, having two dishwashers, given that dishwashers, even the nicest dishwasher, it's not more than a thousand dollars, right? It's not like uh, the dishwasher appliances, the range of dishwasher, maybe it's between 400 and a thousand for like a lower end to a really high end. You know, a refrigerator could be 400 to 8,000. So, in terms of appliances, dishwasher is not expensive, and you might as well get a good one, a quiet one, and you might maybe you can get two. Um, you are giving up 24 inches of base cabinet space to have two dishwashers, and you think, oh, I'm losing a lot of storage. But as I had mentioned, I mean, if you really use the dishwasher like a system in your family where you're, you know, you're, you're taking out clean dishes, you're using those, the dirty ones from dinner are going in there and you're sort of back and forth. You have a system. It's almost like that, that dishwasher is being used as a cabinet. So um, I think it's worth considering if you've got a slightly larger kitchen, I don't think it's overkill to have two dishwashers. I think it can uh, definitely uh, make family life a, a little easier because you don't have that big mountain of dishes in the sink, which I hate. Um, Dirty dishes go right in there. Clean dishes are in the other one, and and there you go. So that's my uh, my second tip: two dishwashers. Dude, that is an awesome tip. If I could redo my kitchen again, I would put two dishwashers in there. I mean, I used to think that was the most ridiculous thing right. I'd ever heard. 
all of our clients want two dishwashers. Right. It is a great idea. It's super functional because you don't ever have to, or you don't many times have to take those dishes and put them away. You just go right. from dishwasher to table to dishwasher to table. I mean, it's great. I love it. We waste so much time putting dishes right. away in the house. I'm sick of it. Totally agree. Uh, okay, my third tip, know your kitchen work triangle. So many of you, most of you, some of you have probably heard of this, the kitchen work triangle. So what we're doing is we're referring to the plan. I'm going to show two images here. One is a, a U-shaped uh, kitchen configuration, and the other, the other is a parallel-shaped uh, kitchen configuration with a parallel countertop. So in plan, we want to think about uh, working in the kitchen uh, in terms of this triangle. Why is that? Well, there are really three objects or accessories, utilities, uh, functional elements in the kitchen that you're using. You're using that range. You're cooking at the counter to, uh, at the range top or a gas uh, countertop and you're using an oven and and uh, most times those are, that's one unit. Uh, sometimes we've got a double oven off to the side, but if we just think about that range top as one of those items, then we think about the sink as a separate item and then we think about the refrigerator as that third item and you're really going from one to the other all the time. In between, you've got hopefully some counter space uh, to work at, but we want to think about a kitchen in terms of that work triangle and then what we do is we think about how to organize that. So whenever we create a kitchen, first we'll look at this horseshoe organization. We've got a range top at the top there, a sink off to the left and the refrigerator behind it and you can see I've drawn a triangle there. That is a a very typical work triangle for a U-shaped uh, kitchen. And then we'll show the parallel uh, kitchen arrangement. And there we've got uh, the range in the center of the configuration, the line or the horizontal uh, line at the top. And then below that, you've got your sink and your refrigerator. And again, shaped like a triangle. And the reason we're doing that is because you want to be able to access all three of them un in, in an uninterrupted fashion, right? You're moving from one uh, to the next. And that's really what you're doing when you're cooking. The last thing I'll say about uh, kitchen configurations, and I know this uh, because I've been married for over 20 years uh, working in the kitchen with my wife, is that you want the space in between kitchen cabinets to be an absolute minimum of 40 two inches. So I've got a little bit less than that and it's uncomfortable when you've got two people side by side passing each other in that space. So I love to see 48 inches uh, in a big space, in a big kitchen that looks right. In a small kitchen, uh, 48 inches, unless you've got that parallel configuration, 48 inches is tough to get. Uh, so a minimum three feet, six inches or 42 inches is really what you want to see there because you want to be able to move past one another. And the last thing, you also want to be able to open a dishwasher and be able to get by the dishwasher door and 42 inches just barely uh, allows that to happen. Uh, so there you have it, your, your kitchen work triangle and your walkway space. You know, regarding these dimensions, you mentioned this 36, uh, the 42 inches. You said when I was a young architect, I used to try to follow these, these guidelines and make, thing, make things exactly like that, that dimension. Yeah. And as I got older, I realized that I should always have this sort of safety factor, inflate everything by 10, 20 percent just because. Yeah. It's, oh, but, you know, you, you only need 42 inches. And I would always say, you know what, let's make it four feet because it's going to be better. And it yeah. was always better. Just having yeah. just always accounting for just have a little bit more space in everything I do. It's it, it's always sort of paid off. So I sort of design it really optimally. I'm like, OK, now let's grow it by 10 percent, everything. And it yeah. seems to work that way. It's kind of a weird That's great. Thing. I've always sort of tried to design optimally, and then once you sort of squeezed everything the way the best you can do it, then say, all right, now let's loosen it up a little bit. Yeah. I wish I had a Zoom function back then when I was hand drafting, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good My point. third tip has to do with uh, refrigerators. So refrigerators to me are one of the most challenging aspects, uh, parts of a, of, of a kitchen because they're very big. Um, they're very big. They're hard to uh, integrate often can be hard to integrate into a, into a, a kitchen as, and as you've explained, you know, where you put the refrigerator really has a lot to do with how that kitchen is going to work. So um, I've always found it really difficult. The best that I could always sort of figure out was like, okay, we'll get this sort of flat cabinet depth, put the cabinet facing over the refrigerator, try to integrate the best we could do. And Sub-Zero is one of those brands. And a lot of, a lot of companies now make their higher end refrigerators that sort of are built in. They're flatter, 
they, they're built in, they're taller as a result. They're very expensive. They're also very massive, no matter what. So more recently, what I've come across is, and I'm using it for a project, is refrigerator systems that can be broken apart. So a typical refrigerator, you have a freezer, you've got a, a, your a, you know, regular refrigerator part. Often people have a, a beverage refrigerator. Um, they're all in one refrigerator. And now you can break them apart into columns. They call them columns. So you can have now a freezer, you can have a beverage refrigerator, and then a food refrigerator, all three different refrigerators. And they don't have to be next to each other if you don't want to. Um, I just like the flexibility that you're afforded by having the ability to break them apart. So each of them come in, you know, 24, 18, even 24 inches, 30 inches, 36 inches. You can have a 30 inch food refrigerator, a 20, a 24 inch uh, freezer. You could have an 18 inch beverage. You can have them side by side or you can separate them. Mm -hmm. um, I love the flexibility of being able to break apart that big appliance. Um, I am, again, I'm trying it right now for a project. Uh, I think it's working out. I think I, I like the design flexibility. I like being able to kind of break that big element up. We've got basically the food and freezer in one area, and we've got the uh, the uh, beverage refrigerator in a slightly different area. I just like the idea of having that flexibility. Imagine I have to have all three of those together. You'd have this, you know, 30 inches, 24 inches, 24 inches. That's like, how many, how many feet is that? This <laughs> is six and a half feet of, of refrigerator. It's like a giant wall. And, uh, and, uh, to me, it was it's it's too massive. It was not what I was looking for. So I love the flexibility of these columns. And keep in mind, um, I'm talking about columns because they go from floor up to sort of upper cabinet. But you can also have refrigerators that get chopped horizontally, so you've got sort of half a column. You can have just counter type, uh, counter height, or uh, upper refrigerators. So just the flexibility now afforded by these different refri refrigerator systems. Um, to me, it's pretty cool, and uh, it just opened up my imagination of what or how a, a kitchen can be designed. Now, is that a, is that a sub zero product, or are lots no, of companies there's different doing companies this now. now? I mean, they're all higher end, but um, okay. there's different companies making them. And um, yeah, I don't want to talk about sub zero because I, when I talk to clients, I often give them advice about my experiences with that company. Um, but that's not the purpose of this podcast, so I don't want to. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> some issues. I mean, it's like a, you know, imagine, I don't know, but I heard, I, I don't have a Range Rover, but I heard people buy Range Rovers, it's a really nice car, but they have issues. So, right. You know, I still, it, it, you know, it's, it's still the brand that I want. And I say, yeah. but well, you look good driving. Down. Why do you, why do you keep buying? It's a Range Rover. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, well, that's, that's a tips on uh, kitchens. You know, I should say, Doug, that. That as I, you know, this has really become a hyper-specialized part of a, of a home. And often people think they don't need an architect. Um, they think, oh, you know, you guys do the house and then we'll have this guy do the kitchen. And it's not to say that those people aren't experts because they are experts. But I, I feel that um, when working couple, together in collaboration, that's really the best uh, scenario. Even if you want to bring on a really good kitchen designer, that's, by the way, selling product. It's not like a free design. Right? try to sell your cabinets or appliances. Nevertheless, it is helpful to have that uh, that expert. I mean, for me, I don't know every appliance that's coming out. I don't do that every day. Whereas they're on the floor, they know really what's happening. They are dealing with so many different kitchens, selling this many dishwashers per year, and uh, they have a good sense of those. So I think it's good to have the architect with you to ask those questions. If if sound from dishwashers matters to you, or if uh, applying, uh, the energy usage matters to you, or certain features or functions matter to you, then it's good to have the architect with you. I think uh, really think of it more collaboratively working with, let's say, kitchen designer, appliance salesman, um, architect, and homeowner, I think is really all together to make uh, the kitchen you, your dream kitchen. Good point. All right, Doug. So we do have a question of the week uh, this week. Uh, it is not about kitchens necessarily, but I'm curious about your, uh, your response because it has to do with renovation. Yes. Dear Doug and Steve, we just purchased a two-family uh, two house. We plan to rent out the first floor and live on the second floor. Currently, the first floor plan, the floor plan, oh, currently the floor plan does not work for our needs, and we would like to alter the floor plan substantially. Is it possible for an architect to provide a master plan, quote, for the entire floor, and also a plan where we can renovate room by room while we live in the space? So two questions, I guess. One is that can can we design a master plan for the entire floor? Which of course, yes. But um, and also um, a plan. I guess this has to do with um, maybe sequencing or something, where they can go sort of bit by bit. I guess I don't know if you if you've done that, Doug. But uh, what's your thoughts about this uh, two-family home owner? 
So are they renovating the first floor and the second floor or just their floor, the second floor? Renovate the second floor. So renovate. Yeah, sure. So absolutely. I mean, it's a great idea to get an architect involved because that's really what they do. Is they do an awful lot of planning. And, you know, what I do is I'd sit down with a client and we'd go through you know, precisely what they want to do. And then they talk about their lives, right? And they discuss how they live and what is most important to them. And then you start to, you know, take a pen to or a pencil to to some sketch paper and you put together uh, a plan. So yeah, planning where the rooms are and the sequencing of them through there. And absolutely, you know, <clears throat> I do this more with smaller projects, in particular my own. So if I'm going to renovate my house, we can stage different portions of the house, right? So we go kind of room by room, we move the furniture into other rooms and, and then the contractor can get, go in there and put up plastic walls to keep dust out of different spaces and we sequence them one after the other. So we're, we're currently, we're gonna renovate our living room and we're gonna uh, add a, a large closet to the master bedroom, which is still on the interior of their house. We're gonna sequence all of that work. So absolutely a good contractor uh, would be the person you call after you're all done with that plan. And then you talk about how to sequence it so you can live in the house while the renovation works going on. However, uh, I would uh, highly recommend uh, if you're going to be renovating your whole home to move out while the renovation goes on. We've seen clients, even in big homes with lots of money, try to stay in their home while they're renovating it. And it turns into a living hell uh, for mm -hmm. everybody. Um, yeah. So very, very difficult to do. But if you don't have a lot of money, you can absolutely sequence, uh, stage those rooms one by one in your home. It takes a little bit more time, but it does get pretty, no matter how hard you try to keep the dust out of the house, it's still going to happen. So that's the big challenge. So I guess, yeah. The, so the first question is, uh, do we provide a master plan? And the master plan, yes, that's kind of the end result. But it seems like what they're looking for is uh, the sequencing plan. So we say, look, Number one, we're going to have to do the master bath. Let's do that. That's going to require this, that, and this. We'll seal that <laughs> off. We could, that'll take about a month, whatever. Take about a month, cost you about X. I would start there, then move to the kitchen, open up the master bath, uh, maybe sort of hot, you know, seal off the kitchen. You're going to have to move out for a week or whatever. But, but basically, it seems like they want that step-by-step. -step. Yep. Um, maybe it doesn't exactly say what, the, the, you know, what, at what time of the year, but it's more like, Hey, part A, I would recommend this, this, that's going to cost about X. It's going to probably take about four weeks. You can live there while this happens. Part B, whenever you do this, is probably going to cost about this. you got to move out for a week or two because you're going to have no water or no heat or whatever it's going to be, right? Part three is painting this, that. You can live there. Why don't we seal off the house? So it, we, we can do it. I think really it's a function of trying to create a larger global master plan then finding a builder or contractor, I guess, that's going to be willing to play along with this. And as you say, Doug, I hate when people try to live in the renovation besides getting in the way and taking them. It, it just takes more time. Right. Uh, it's going to cost more. You think you're saving. You're not. You're, you're, you're getting in the way. You're costing time. Contractors don't like it. You know, they really, believe it or not, they don't like to be watched every second. Well, oh, my much. gosh. Right. Um, and um, I, I always try to not recommend it. Dust is going to get everywhere. You're going to complain. You're not going to have water. It's just it's just it, it's not a it's not a great scenario. In this case, look, they're trying to save money. It seems like I mean, I, I'm sure they're trying to save some money here. Um, I would really maybe there's certain spaces that you could live with kitchen baths. It's it's better to, to move out for a little bit um, yeah. and uh, let the big, big, messy stuff happen. Um, you know, drywall dust is a disaster. Paint smells is awful. Yes. Varnishing or, uh, uh, varnishing or, or finishing floors is toxic. I mean, these these are things you don't want to be living in and sleeping. Uh, nice. sleep. I think this person, um, I think or someone they mentioned they own a cat. I mean, you know, the cat's going to be in the way. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you just don't want all this. Um, so if you, can, if you can move out, um, yes, an architect can work with you to master plan but also help to sequence this. And, and I'll tell you, it's not going to be easy to find a contractor, um, depending upon your area, but most don't like this kind of arrangement. They want to get in, bang out the job, be there for two months or however long it is and get out. They don't want to come in, you know, come in just for four days, then go away and we'll call you back and when? In three months. Okay, three months, call you two. It's not easy to, to get Very somebody tough. who really likes that unless you're going to pay for it. So yes, that's my thoughts. Right on.
Already, Doug. So that's uh, that's kitchens. You know, I was thinking for next time. I don't know how you think about it, but uh, I've been asked a lot about my tools, my favorite tools. Certainly, okay. trace paper comes to mind, but the, the tools that an architect uses, Ooh, why I love that. find the most useful? Do you want to try to do something like that? I love it. Let's do it. Yeah, so it's three tools each, and um, you know, I, people are always wondering about some of my tools, like, oh, do you use that compass? Like this compass right here? Oh, my drop compass for making tiny circles? No, I don't use it anymore. I like having it. It's a cool artifact, but I don't, I don't <laughs> use it anymore. Uh, the computer, it seems to make them much easier. Yeah. Uh, but we still use cool tools, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that next time. So until that, next time, Doug, why don't you take it away? So you've been watching or listening to Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. Uh, please shoot us an email. Let us know what you think. And uh, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time.